Hi everyone, welcome back to the Continuous Tongue. The topic today is going to be bags under the eyes or periorbital puffiness. We're going to talk about uh, that, even some facial congestion, uh, and the factors that are potentially leading up to that. So this is going. To, this is actually a lecture that I'm, I'm pretty excited to give uh, because I think it's it's pretty it's very interesting, and it, I know it may not sound interesting, but hopefully by the end of it, you're going to uh, have gained a lot from it. And just if you enjoy this video, uh, there's going to be a link under the video below uh, to the Continuous Tongue course. And then there's also going to be a series of links to all the things that we've uh, talked about in this, in this video if you want to check some other things out. So periorbital puffiness. Let's talk a little bit about some theories and other factors. As I was looking at, at different reasons as to why we get um, bags under our eyes, uh, I, I came across an article where a doctor from Johns Hopkins just said basically it was a natural part of aging. Now I don't know that I fully agree with that, uh, especially given you look at the picture on the right hand side. Uh, this child is uh, probably not have uh, bags under their eyes from natural aging. So there's also lack of or poor sleep that is a factor, fluid retention, and I know I've heard before the underdevelopment of the of the maxilla, the upper jaw, that then ends up cutting the venous circulation off uh, as the veins exit the orbit. And I'm not sure I fully uh, agree with that either and then I'm sure there's plenty of other theories but in this video what I want to talk about is what I think is happening in this scenario so where we start is first going through uh, the background so we're going to talk about uh, the venous drainage of the eyes first of all and there's two pathways for it there is an internal or intracranial pathway and then there is also an external pathway so the intracranial or internal pathway is embedded in the skull. Uh, it's a closed system uh, that is going to be embedded in the, in, in the, within the skull. And then the external pathway is obviously going to be outside of the skull. And so we're going to talk about uh, those in more depth now. So first, let's talk about the intracranial pathway. So. Uh, as we're talking about venous drainage from the eyes, uh, we can imagine, say, the eyes are here in the front of the head, and there are two blood vessels, the superior uh, ophthalmic vein, and then, um, and then inferior to that is the inferior ophthalmic vein. Those two blood vessels then drain into the head from the eye socket and the eye, uh, and uh, drain into a structure called the cavernous dural venous sinus or the cavernous sinus. So once it is in the head in this, in, in this enclosed system in the skull, uh, then the venous blood uh, here is in a valveless system network of of veins that are embedded within the dural membranes. So if you look at this picture here, you see all these large blood vessels and you can see how they're, uh, they're kind of embedded in this opaque structure. This is the falx cerebri of the dural membrane. And then uh, if we were to look more in 3D, uh, a, there's another membrane coming around the side of the head, which also has uh, blood vessel embedded in it. That's called the tentorium cerebelli. And then uh, those form part of the uh, dural membranes in the, in the skull. Now these are part of that reciprocal tension membrane that I was referring to uh, in another video where when you have one part that is taut and tight, the other part is slack and you're constantly going back and forth uh, as, as the dural membranes are moving during the respiration uh, inhalation and exhalation of the primary respiratory mechanism. Now these, I believe part of the reason why these large blood vessels are embedded in the dura is because of that motion uh, in, within the dura. So basically 
this acts like a dural pump. However, uh, we were talking about this being a closed system. Uh, the, the dural membranes don't have the ability to uh, adapt to changes. So meaning they're, they're not going to be able to speed up their, uh, their ability to pump or slow down dramatically. So uh, there has to be another system. So when, the way this venous blood flow goes through here, it's all valveless. And the way it has been described is that uh, it all comes, uh, a lot of the blood comes to the, towards the back of the head and then, or drains into uh, larger sinuses on the way and then it exits the skull through the jugular foramen via the internal jugular vein. So that is more or less, I believe, what I learned in med school. Here's another and just another view of it. So just just to orient ourselves, we're looking uh, here. We've we've sliced the uh, this the through the head uh, front to back uh, to see all these structures. Whereas in this picture on the right, we've sliced along a horizontal plane. However, this large blood vessel here, corresponding to this one here. Uh, has not been cut through and is and so uh, just to orient ourselves this is where the nose would be and then this is the roof of the orbit or the eye socket so we would have blood vessels the superior and inferior ophthalmic vein coming into the skull and draining into this structure here this reservoir is this is the cavernous sinus and as you can see it's connected through a network of to all these veins and then ultimately they drain uh, here, which is the jugular foramen. And so this blood vessel here, once it exits through, becomes the internal jugular. And, and once it exits out of the skull, uh, this is both on, on the right and left sides. So I hope that is clear. And then we can move on. So this is all hopefully making sense however it is not this simple because when we're upright uh, venous blood flow out of the skull is primarily through uh, vertebral plexus uh, that means that blood uh, is absent or negligible draining out of the internal jugular and blood is shunted through a structure called anterior condylar confluence uh, to the vertebral plexus. Uh, so the vertebral plexus then is, is, it also has internal and external, or it has internal and external, uh, it's a network of internal and external blood vessels uh, within, uh, around the vertebra or inside the, inside the vertebrae or, or around it, and they communicate with each other. Now, in the vertebral system within uh, the internal system the the blood vessels are also valveless so uh, so during the day uh, or when we're upright then the blood flow is generally going to be through this vertebral plexus now when we're lying down then venous blood flow then favors more the internal jugular vein uh, through the jugular foramen much like we were talking about earlier now, one question you may we, you may be asking is, well, why does this happen? And and my interpretation of this is that um, you know there's a there's a fluid dynamic shift when we're going from being upright to laying down. However, I think when we're upright, we are generally going to be more active. More there's going there should be more motion movement, and what this does is it pulls the blood from the closed internal system out to the periphery where there's valved vessels and then get drained back to the heart. So when we're sleeping and lying down there, uh, you, you cannot, the body cannot rely as much on these pumps. We're not active generally, we're not moving. So this is the, the way to uh, get drainage out of the skull. Uh, when those pumps are not as active. That's my interpretation and I hope that um, is, is clear so far. Now let's talk about the external pathways. 
So there is um, the superior ophthalmic vein, which is found up here. The inferior ophthalmic vein, it connects to this larger blood vessel here. This is called the facial vein. The inferior ophthalmic vein that drains into the cavernous sinus has a large or a branch that exits through this structure, a structure called the inferior orbital fissure. That's how it exits the eye socket and then comes back here and blends into a uh, vascular, a venous plexus called the pterygoid plexus. So the blood vessels of the eye and, uh, and the eyelids both drain through this internal pathway, um, internal pathway through the uh, inferior, or superior and inferior ophthalmic veins. They go into the cavernous sinus, into this venous plexus, and then also through this facial vein. Now the facial vein here is uh, connected strongly to the pterygoid plexus, which I am showing here. So uh, I hope that is that part so far is clear. So the conjunctiva of the eyelids, you have a lot of tiny venules and capillaries, uh, a large network of them. So this becomes a watershed area uh, where uh, I, I believe then you'd be more prone to changes with pressure within, this, within the uh, venous system. So uh, within the skull, we have valved or valveless uh, uh, venous sinuses, basically large blood vessels that have no valves. Externally, however, these vessels have valves. The facial vein, uh, which is pointed with this red arrow, has a valve or has valves, and then the superior ophthalmic and inferior ophthalmic veins have valves uh, and. Uh, and then drain into the cavernous sinuses as soon as they exit the, the, uh, or enter the skull. And I think that is all I want to say about that so far. Let's take a look at, uh, here on the right hand side, uh, hopefully you can see this, but there's a, there is a large space here, a, a hole. And you can even see there's grooves in here, and I believe this groove will, would likely be for the inferior uh, orbital or ophthalmic, the branch of the inferior ophthalmic vein that is exits through here to go into the pterygoid plexus in the what is called the infratemporal uh, fossa. Now, we may a lot of times we often don't think about this as a as an important drainage pathway uh, however uh, I know that uh, I as a as an osteopathic physician who uh, having treated the uh, eyes manually I have developed a technique in one of my core in one of my courses called an osteopathic approach to the eyes where I'm, I'm increasing this space to to enhance uh, drainage out of the orbit and um, in, in, in a sense get better drainage into the pterygoid plexus. And when I have done that I've had access to a uh, device that measures intraocular pressure or eye pressure and I have had in, um, in people who uh, normal patients who do not have glaucoma but have had their pressure to the higher end of normal I've had decreases in uh, pressure by up to five points uh, by doing this and I have uh, tested it out and made sure that they they didn't have these changes by lying down on my table so I had them lay down for a while um, and then had them sit back up and measured their eye pressure multiple times and their numbers stayed the same and after opening this space up I did have decreases there so uh, one thing I also noted was that as we were able to open this space up and there was better drainage out of the uh, orbit that that often relieved pressure behind the eyes so a lot of people who are having headaches where they're describing pressure behind the eyes 
uh, this often was in a way of helping that as well. So this is a diagram just basically showing kind of what we've described so far. So what we've, uh, just to summarize, we have a intracranial pathway that is valveless and we have an external pathway that has valves. So we get blood uh, drainage from the eyes via the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins that then go into the cavernous dural sinus. Uh, this is an elaborate network that then goes eventually goes through and drains into the internal jugular via the jugular foramen. Um, and then we have this external pathway that where we get drainage from the eyes and then there's a branch from the inferior ophthalmic vein that then drains into the pterygoid plexus and then from the pterygoid plexus it drains into a vein called the maxillary vein and then uh, further back it joins a larger blood vessel that is called the and becomes the retromandibular vein and then eventually they link and join up to the internal and external jugular uh, vein further down so does that make sense? I hope so, but uh, this is not the complete picture. And so what we want to do then is look at this a little bit more closely. So this is a little bit more of uh, more accurate. We have uh, there's actually because the intracranial pathway is closed, uh, it is, it, it's important that there be communication between the intracranial pathway and the external pathway because if there is a buildup of pressure, then there has to be a way to get that blood from out of the skull uh, more appropriately. So what we have are called emissary veins, and they are found uh, throughout the skull, but we're, in this case, from the cavernous sinus, uh, it has some veins that exit. The emissary veins are also valveless, by the way, and they connect to the pterygoid plexus. So what we have is um, venous blood flow that directly connects from the cavernous sinus to the pterygoid plexus. And then furthermore, uh, throughout the rest of this closed intracranial system, there are other emissary veins, especially in the back uh, closer to the back of the skull that then connect to the vertebral venous system when we're upright. Uh, and so a more accurate picture then is that uh, when, we're, when we're laying down, you get drainage from the jugular foramen. And when we're upright, then these emissary veins are uh, draining more to the vertebral system and blood is shunted into this vertebral system. So what I am proposing here is, and I'm not sure, I, I hadn't found anything else like this, but uh, it's possible, I'm sure other people have, have thought about this, is that the external pathway is, is in like an overflow system. So when you get an increase in, in pressure, blood flow into the head, uh, if, if because the, it's a closed system and there isn't a way to increase drainage directly out by its... Um, by say like the motion of the reciprocal tension membranes those are moving at a at a rhythmic pace they're not able to ramp up or ramp down then blood has to be shunted uh, to this overflow system and when we're active and moving which uh, because these external pathways have valves they they may then have less pressure and draw blood out from the skull and and shunt um, or shunt that blood and, and keep it um, um, keep the help keep drain that blood out of the skull more efficiently. But this is still not the complete picture. There's there's still more going on here that we need to look at before we can understand uh, periorbital puffiness. Okay, so now we're going to take a closer look at the pterygoid plexus. Now, if you recall, this was a plexus of veins that uh, where we get blood drainage from the eyes and other places that collect uh, in what is called the infratemporal space, and that is around uh, in, that would be in this area towards the back of the cheek. 
So the pterygoid plexus uh, is found in this space called the infratemporal fossa. It lies between the temporalis muscle, which is this large muscle here, although it's lying in, in this area, then um, that and then the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles. So uh, those are shown here. These are deeper. The, the, this is the lateral pterygoid muscle here, and then this is the medial one. And so all of these muscles, the tempor temporalis muscle, the lateral and the medial pterygoids are all muscles of mastication. Uh, so that is an important concept to, or important point to remember. So what I am proposing here is that the, the uh, pterygoid plexus and, and other external plex plexuses promote intracranial venous drainage when they are being drained appropriately. So if, if this plexus is 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 more empty it's going to draw blood from the valveless system because there's no valve so the blood is going to naturally drain to a system where there is lower uh, pressure and so but the pterygoid plexus to function appropriately relies on a pump and that is why it is situated where it is situated that is uh, to me, my answer, or I think the way nature has answered, uh, it's, it's a system to help drain blood out of the skull. So when we chew through a strong full range of motion, meaning you're opening all the way and closing and you're having resistance potentially, then that is going to act as a pump to drain blood out of the pterygoid plexus. And there is a lot of benefits from going through this strong uh, full range of motion chewing that we're going to get into in another video for, that'll be another topic for another time that i think is also super interesting but i think nowadays with our modern lifestyles most of us do not sufficiently plump blood out of the pterygoid plexus we eat soft foods rarely are we ever having to open like wide to chew and then we're not getting much resistance when we're chewing, uh, which I believe is something that we were designed to do. So I, I may have already explained this, but uh, I just want to make sure that it is explained clear is that we have the valvous intracranial system, these emissary veins, these are small veins here connecting to the pterygoid plexus. And so uh, when there is, when this system is drained properly, it's going to promote blood flow out of the intracranial system into this plexus where it has valves and then it can be pushed out towards the heart. Now, if this is not drained properly, then the, it's going to be harder to get the blood out from inside the, from the internal system to the, to this plexus. And the same is true of the, any plexus around the skull that is helping to drain blood out. But if we don't have, uh, if, there, if there, the pressure in the pterygoid plexus is not less than, uh, than these veins coming in, then you're not going to have blood flow drained out through this system as efficiently. Uh, the, you would need to have an increase in the pressure of this blood to, and overcome the less pressure here in order to push blood out. So going back to our diagram here, now we're, we're adding some things here. So we've talked about the overflow system here, and then we're, we're looking more closely at the, we've looked more closely at the pterygoid plexus, and we realize that it needs a strong chewing pump. To function efficiently that's how we were designed so by chewing we're essentially milking this plexus pushing the blood out through and then that helps get drainage out of the uh, internal system but this is not the complete picture because we need to look at the tongue's role in in all of this because 
Uh, another thing that I am going to be pr uh, uh, proposing here is that the tongue is a venous pump. Now, I want to explain a little bit about why I've, I've come to this conclusion, but when I have been diagnosed with uh, severe sleep apnea, and I have gone through uh, dental or palate uh, expansion and remodeling through a device, uh, th with a DNA device, and when I was getting set up for this 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 appliance that I was to wear at night, uh, they before uh, while while it was being made, uh, I was given a more of a, like a bite guard that would help bring my jaw forward, but then also uh, it more or less it was just like a, a rubber piece then. It would force me to breathe through my nose because it was closed in the front and then also uh, it didn't have any blockage to the roof of my uh, to the my palate so my tongue could rest there while I slept and when I finally started sleeping that way when I put that appliance in for the first time uh, I woke up and just felt much less pressure under my eyes than, than I have probably in a long time I mean I've, I'm pressure under the eyes and, and uh, bags under the eyes is something that I've had for a very long time. And so uh, when I when I slept with this appliance in, I, I felt better in the mornings. Uh, and then when I got my other appliance, uh, it was bulky for one, uh, but it also covered my palate. So there were two things that were happening here. I was unable to sleep at night um, where I could keep my lips shut so I couldn't uh, breathe through my nose as well and I would wake up every morning with my mouth dry but then also because there was a piece of acrylic covering my palate I could not rest my tongue up on my palate and when I when I slept with this appliance uh, I did not feel as rested and I felt like the congestion the bags under my eyes that pressure uh, was worse and when I eventually uh, I, I started taping my lips shut uh, so that I could keep them closed at night and slowly breathe through my nose and that improved and my, my sleeping improved during that time as my uh, palate was uh, expanded. So I, I, I came to the conclusion that there, ha there is likely a role there that where the tongue plays in terms of drainage and so I've, I've looked at that and tried to understand it and so that's what I'm going to explain here and then we're going to try to tie it all in together. So what we have here uh, is uh, we have the superior ophthalmic vein that is the oh let me back up here this picture is showing arteries uh, however uh, from what I've been able to find the arteries are often accompanied by by the um, by ve veins. So in this in this picture, what we're going to do is we're going to rather than look at these as arteries, we're going to look at them as, as veins. So just anywhere that it says artery here, we're just going to switch that for veins, and we're going to imagine these are veins. Okay. So what we have is we've got the superior ophthalmic vein, and as it's coursing back to the cavernous sinus, it has some branches that come off of it, and these branches. Uh, then drain and become the anterior, anterior here, and posterior ethmoid veins. So these are highly, uh, this picture is not really representative of what it's like. These, there's a lot more branches here, uh, and then they all connect also with this uh, sphenopalatine what would probably would be the sphenopalatine vein and then there is drainage through the incisive canal so they're coming up here and this is this would be the roof of the mouth here and then back here there is uh, would be the greater and lesser palatine veins and they all connect here together however the blood is flowing this way there so the these veins are connecting back here and then they're continuing back here and going to the pterygoid plexus. So I hope that makes sense. We've got branches from the ophthalmic vein, they're coming down, 
Uh, they enter the nasal cavity. From the nasal cavity, they're, they go into the, uh, the palate. They connect with other veins here from the, uh, and then they continue into the pterygoid plexus. So, uh, let's look at the next slide. And so what we're looking at here is the tongue under normal circumstances rests on the roof of the, or on the palate. That's where it should rest under natural, uh, under normal resting, uh, that should be its normal resting posture is, is on the palate. Uh, and this often isn't what happens with a lot of people nowadays. But when it rests here on the palate through uh, the respiration, inhalation, and exhalation of the primary respiratory mechanism, which we talked about in another video, and even just regular uh, inhalation and exhalation of, of our normal respiration, the tongue ends up acting like a pump. So when it's up on the palate, it's kind of suction there, and as it just comes down slightly but maintains its contact, rhythmically, it's acting as a pump. Now. If you want to have an experience of this, what I recommend you do is you put your tongue up on the on your palate, suction it there, and then try to s maintain that suction but pull down strongly. And if you can do that without breaking that contact and hold it for a while, a lot of times uh, people will feel uh, their nasal cavity open up and they'll they'll feel some uh, they'll have some sensations uh, in their face of. of uh, just kind of like an opening feeling kind of in their face or different sensations in their face. So when the tongue uh, it acts like this pump like this, it's pulling blood, venous blood, out of the nasal cavity and ultimately from the uh, superior ophthalmic vein. It's drawing this blood out uh, and then um, into the palate and draining it into the pterygoid plexus. Okay, so now going back to our diagram here, what we're adding here is that we have this intracranial pathway, this valveless pathway, although the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins have valves, they have their two branches, the anterior and posterior ethmoidal veins that then ultimately uh, end up uh, draining into the hard palate. From there, they, they meet the uh, the greater and lesser palatine veins and the tongue as it pumps that blood out uh, into the pterygoid plexus. Now one thing I also want to mention is I believe uh, along with this tongue pump is that uh, it's not solely the tongue pump but also air entering into the nasal cavity uh, when air is going in it's the pressure on the walls of the nasal cavity increases just slightly and when you breathe out you know we're, we're getting a decrease in that so that in itself the air going in and out uh, is also a a subtle uh, pump that helps drain that blood flow but this is probably still not the complete picture. And at this point, this is, this is almost all I know, but then there's, there's all the other emissary veins, uh, even uh, throughout the vertebral column and all that. So that's, but that explains, that's what I'm trying to uh, explain to you guys here. And hopefully you've been able to follow with me so far. And if not, uh, then you may wanna watch this video multiple times, but I, I, I think this material is very interesting. So let's let's talk about putting it all together. So when when there is uh, or there's the intracranial internal uh, closed system where you have valveless uh, blood vessels, and so when they're when they're valveless, the blood can then flow to the areas of, of best drainage. And so the way I see it is the external pathways are a way to help regulate the venous congestion in the internal system. And so pressure in the, in the emissary veins it must be higher than the, than the pressure in whatever plexus they're going into to flow into it. 
And when we when we're constantly active and pumping out the plexus, we're creating a negative pressure there that then pulls that blood uh, from the intracranial system into the plexus. So pumps such as hard chewing, nasal breathing, and this tongue rhythmic suction on the palate help maintain lower plexus pressure uh, out of in the external system and helps keep the uh, intracranial drainage uh, more efficient. Now, if drainage is sluggish and the pumps are not being used as well as possible, like we're not chewing very strongly, which many of us don't, uh, we're not nasal breathing, and we are not resting our tongue on the palate, which is very common. There's a lot of mouth breathers nowadays. Uh, we have a lot of high arches and tongue ties and things like that, improper tongue mechanics where then the palate is uh, really high and the tongue isn't able to make good contact uh, with the palate, then, uh, th then there ends up being an inefficient drainage. And so the, the small blood vessels at the lower eyelids and in this area where you have the watershed region, they, those blood vessels then are the ones that are going to be the most affected. They, be, they can then become engorged and you're going to have uh, edema and you're gonna have congestion that ensues but what about sleeping let's talk a little bit about that uh, just to try to be as, as complete as possible so so at night the brain go, starts to go through a clearing waste process this process is not well understood but there's lymphatic vessels that are embedded in the lymph in the in the dural uh, membranes and even a glymphatic system uh, that, that all these have recently been discovered in the last couple years and so there there seems to be uh, increased maybe inflammation or, or increased uh, congestion in this area and uh, proper sleeping helps to clear out this this junk now when we're sleeping the drainage out of the skull tends to favor the jugular foramen uh, I think partly because we're not active and we're not then uh, able to push the blood uh, from these valveless systems out into the periphery. So when we're sleeping, the active pumps aren't as active, so then the favor is going to, there the blood flow is going to favor the jugular foramen. Now the, the tongue resting on the palate during sleep ends up being a passive pump, so it's going to, it still is effective and working even, even though we're not actively uh, we're not being active with that. So with the tongue, you have the ability to have an active pump or a passive pump. And, and the, true, the same is true even with, obviously, with nasal breathing. Uh, you can adjust how you're breathing and all that, but you can, uh, and, and, and uh, that potentially could be a pump for that. So, so those with high arch palates from tongue ties, bad mechanics, and whatever other reasons, uh, potentially would have varying degrees of losing this pump function, whether uh, it's one part of it, all of it. And so by not being able to drain as efficiently through this system, the result is venous backup at the small vessels under the eyes, a bluish, and you end up with potentially a, a bluish hue in this area. And uh, then you're gonna have more facial congestion. Uh, and, and we haven't going and just going back to this slide, uh, you know, we, we've been talking about the venous system, but there's also the lymphatics that become affected by this. So when the when the venous system is not able to drain well, the lymphatics drain into the, the veins themselves. So then they are going to be more prone to backing up and being uh, less efficient as well. So with what we've been trying to explain, I've been trying to explain to you a system that then explains why bags under the eyes get larger when we increase fluid retention, because then you get increased pressure, uh, probably to a higher end of normal, not an abnormal amount of pressure. But then you're, if, if we are not able to drain properly through your pumps, then, uh, then you're gonna end, up, gonna end up showing in these watershed areas. Now with mouth breathing, uh, we end up seeing more congestion around the eyes and in the face and so and, and especially during during with sleep uh, when you don't have the tongue and venous pumps then uh, you're going to be more prone to waking up with uh, uh, bags under the eyes 
So if lack of sleep increases fluid retention because then you're you're not draining that uh, the, uh, the uh, increased uh, what's pressure from the uh, brain doing its clearing process, then the risk of bags under the eyes will be higher. Now, if you do this over for one time, that's that's going to be one thing. But if if this happens chronically then even resolving this, you're still likely going to continue to have bags under your eyes. Uh, I do not agree that this is necessarily a natural part of aging. Uh, I, I do think that if you can maintain normal function here, there's no reason why an older person would be should have to uh, develop bags under their eyes. Okay. So in one of the foundational videos of this course, uh, we were talking about this study. So what we've, what we've done in this lecture is gone through and explained why when you take a, a rhesus monkey, for example, and you obstruct the nasal passages, you force the monkey to mouth breathe, how you end up with congestion uh, in the face and under the eye and, and really around the eyes. And so part of this is that this monkey uh, has lost both the nasal and tongue function ability. Uh, it is not really possible to rest your tongue on your palate and breathe through your mouth so easily. So that is not something that happens. We end up with a floor of the mouth posture. Now let's talk a little bit about what you can do. Uh, Simple things are avoid foods, drinks that are going to increase fluid retention. You want to make sure you're exercising. That is going to get all your, your pumps to drain. Uh, make sure you improve your sleeping habits. Uh, if Make sure you're getting enough sleep and, and all that. But if you're still waking up with problems, then you may need to get a sleep study because uh, then potentially you could have sleep apnea or some other sleeping disorders. Uh, make sure to chew through your full range of motion and do that often. Uh, I actually recommend a product called Jawser Size, uh, which is something that I've, I've used that I'm putting a link under this video, and, and it's it basically is going to help develop uh, your jaw, uh, facial, and even upper neck muscles, and it's a very simple uh, product to use, and I've been very impressed by uh, what it does uh, I, 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 and we're going to talk about that more in the chewing uh, lecture. Make sure you spend time during the day with your tongue resting up on your palate if you don't normally do that and if you can't do it comfortably or you have a hard time with that uh, then I recommend finding a myofunctional therapist who can then evaluate you and see if maybe uh, what the factors are that are that, are, that would be causing that and then work with you to improve that. Uh, you want to then during the day, if you can rest your tongue and put your tongue up on the roof of your mouth, uh, spend some time actively suctioning down, downward strongly. And then uh, make sure that uh, when you sleep, you're sleeping with your mouth closed if you can and, and try to have your, try to be doing nasal breathing and have your tongue on, the, on your palate. So that is this course and just for just, just as for you this is we're kind of going back to everything we have talked about uh, so just as a last uh, conclusion summary everything of, of everything we've talked about is we've got the valveless intracranial system that then basically uh, is a closed system and we've got this overflow system of, of external pathways. We have a tongue and nasal pump that, that pump helps drain blood from uh, the intracranial pathway into the pterygoid plexus. Uh, we have a connection directly from the dural sinuses from the internal um, system to the external system and, and then chewing strongly helps to drain uh, this blood out and into the jugular uh, or system back to the heart. This is probably still not the full complete picture. I'm sure there's there's more things from here, but uh, this is what I wanted to share with you today. I hope you have enjoyed this lecture, and if you have any questions or comments, 
uh, feel free to uh, make a comment uh, under this video. So if you enjoyed this video, first of all, I'm gonna say thank you. And then if you wanna learn more about the Continuous Tongue course, you wanna see more videos like this, because there will be a lot more uh, videos uh, kind of talk in this topic of uh, the tongue's relation to, to eyes, to craniofacial development, to the rest of the body. Uh, that's what this course is about. And, and we're gonna be going through things in depth and more so than I have ever been able to do before. Now links for things that we've talked about during this video I'm posting below too so feel free to check those out and I'll see you another time. Thank you.